Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Tony Bardo, the Assistant Vice President of Government Solutions at Hughes Networks. Tony, good to have you on. Thanks, Tom. And if you would, review for us this whole idea of modernization, especially network modernization, transformation that's going on in the federal government, especially now that there's a lot of money and a lot of emphasis now toward modernization. I think a lot of, a lot of agencies are going to be looking at their networks as one of the foundational pieces to modernize and transform. So tell us what it means nowadays, especially using that EIS contract. Tom, it's a great time to be talking about transformation and modernization uh, and evolution. The, um, the EIS contract is, uh, is now in, in full swing. The transition to it is still getting there in the full swing mode. But um, for the last 20 years, um, the, 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 the FTS 2001 contract and then the networks contract were characterized by technology that served its purpose at the time, um, but is, is no longer adequate to really fulfill the, the needs of, of bandwidth hungry applications that all, the, all of the agencies have. So it's a great time. The, the, the timing was a little off just a little bit, and that was really nobody's fault. GSA had to proceed with the what was called the NS2020 uh, initiative, which included a, uh, the EIS contract. And um, there was still the old technology left in the can, if you will, or, or in, in, in service. And the new technologies hadn't really come into play like SD-WAN and modern uh, broadband met managed networks. So the, the contract started off with a, like, a heavy like-for-like -like emphasis and a heavy like-for-like -like, um, uh, quotient that, that uh, really wasn't enabling transformation just yet. So some of the early fair opportunities came out from a lot of the big agencies. And um, there were nine vendors on the EIS contract and all ready to go, but some of them were, uh, some of these vendors were still heavily invested in the uh, NPLS technologies that, uh, that were evident at the time. So you had this conundrum of of you know, how do we release, how do we get out, out and get these fair opportunities out the door so we can begin the transition process to the new contract when we don't have any, um, any cleanse for the new technologies. So GSA stepped up to that um, and sort of closed that timing and, and enabled the, the new technology. So it's a, it's a wonderful time to do that. I think what we have are some awards that were made early on and you know the early adopters sort of had had to you know make up that ground and be caught with a contract with a selected awardee that maybe might not have been the best awardee for what's to come so um i think in general everybody can can recover from that i think it's going to put the timetables that gsa has in place maybe in jeopardy um but we're on our way and when you say like for like, in other words, agencies were simply replacing with a new deal the same technology that they had been operating for many years prior. I mean, I mean that exactly, and and therefore, it was it was inconvenient in that and and unproductive in a sense, because not many places in IT, a federal IT was somebody using 20 year old technology. And yet that's what the agencies were doing with their telecom networks. Uh, everywhere else transformation was progressing at a healthy rate, maybe not as fast as some would like, but certainly the network I thought was lagging behind. Like I said, it was really nobody's fault. Um, it's just that the contract timing uh, and the advent of the new technologies weren't quite in sync. And with the emphasis on digital services and on increased user experience for both internal users and external visitors to federal agencies seeking some type of help or service or benefit, do these underlying technologies that you mentioned, say software-defined WANs in particular, as opposed to MPLS and earlier technologies, do they enable that to be deployed better for the customer experience digital services piece? They're absolutely perfect for the digital experience, for customers, for constituents to do 
things with the government, interact with the government uh, online uh, are, are certainly much more uh, enabled because of the, the various access methods that SD-WAN enables the agency to, to deploy, um, methods that would enable people to work with applications uh, far better than, than the legacy networks that were in place before. Now, the, 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 the user experience in terms of using modern broadband and, and the cable technologies and the satellite technologies that people have at their homes uh, they've been using broadband for a long time. It's just that the government networks that were supporting them were not using those those more adaptive technologies. And how do these new technologies help, say, in the hybrid cloud situation? Because more and more agencies are both modernizing their own data centers, replicating their data centers in other companies' closed cage co-location centers, and using commercial clouds, really three pieces of the hybrid architecture and does this whole SD-WAN thing help enable that and move that along? Absolutely, it, it, it helps the agencies uh, work better together. It helps uh, the SD-WAN technologies puts the proper uh, transport or the proper traffic on the proper transports and it enables voice, for instance, to be completely interactive and, and, and fast, uh, fast acting and so forth. And, and certain, certain slower applications that don't need the speed, don't need to, can be sent later on through more latency heavy, heavy uh, uh, technology. Uh, it, 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 it all boils down to a, a, an employee of the government being able to work the right um, network scheme into the conversation or the interaction with the constituent. Yeah, that's one of the uh, key things that you mentioned is the uh, the uh, allocation of speed and resources depending on the application itself. And some applications, as you point out, can't stand any latency. Some of them, you know, a few milliseconds doesn't matter. Nobody will notice. Exactly right. Applications. And so with an SD-WAN type of architecture or technology underlying this, can the applications themselves tell the network what to give priority for? That is the quality of service can be determined automatically so that you have less operator intervention hour by hour in operating your networks? Absolutely, and that, that's why this, this timing now is, is finally um, congealing at the right time and the technology options and the different ways that uh, companies have put together their SD-WAN product. Um, not only the legacy uh, SD-WAN products of the, the traditional carriers, but also the new entrance to the marketplace in EIS and the many choices that they have to present an SD-WAN solution to an agency. Uh, it's, it's to the point now where there's so many improvements uh, that have happened in the last two to three years where the primes have have choices to bring to to bear to the uh, to the uh, uh, proposals that they're 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 responding to on the uh, fair opportunities. And let's sort out just for a minute the transport versus the SD WAN because SD WAN stands for software defined wide area networking, so that by definition it's a piece of software, but ultimately electrons travel on wires to get from point A to point B even over when the wireless segment ends. So what's the relationship technologically between SD-WAN and the transport you're using? And do they go hand in hand when it comes to that need to update them? It can be a combination of various kinds of transports. You've got path diverse transports uh, such as terrestrial and satellite. You've got DSL, which it continues to be viable. Uh, you've got great speeds being offered by the cable companies and partners. So there's that, there's that combination of the dedicated facilities that, that the uh, carriers have and using them in combination with the broadband capabilities through both satellite, cable, DSL, and, and wireless. So you've, get, you've got tremendous flexibility in terms of using multiple transports, multiple kinds of transports, uh, dedicated versus shared technologies. The shared technologies is really where you've seen the cost drivers uh, improve so much for the, it's, it's not so much that any given agency 
is going to spend less than they used to spend last year under the last contract, they're just going to spend maybe probably the same money, but they're going to get so much more power, so much more bandwidth, so much more path diversity in the in case of uh, congestion on one transport or another. There's just many ways in, many ways out. So I think there's there's um, a tremendous uh, productivity, um, um, affordability, and and um, uh, ability to just build it up, build up the network. And with this diversity of pathways, does that also contribute to greater re reliability and continuity of operations for federal agencies? Absolutely. There's, uh, you know, we, we've we've been involved as a, as a company that offers satellite services as well as the uh, traditional uh, uh, broadband uh, terrestrial networks. Certainly, we've seen a lot of it be through through hurricanes, through disasters, and so forth flooding that compromises the terrestrial networks. And for those customers, we've ad advocated and provided uh, for those customers that have taken advantage of it, satellite services to back up at, in a path diverse way uh, the traffic that they, they need to, uh, to use. All right, so agencies contemplating the switch, and I guess most of them are contemplating it, and there's been some orders, but to get EIS really into your or the services and products on EAS into your agency, what do you have to do? I mean, what, what, what's the untaken step at this point? Well, the untaken step is that there's still a lot, still too many fair opportunities that haven't come out the door yet that need to, 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 to make these deadlines that GSA has imposed, and rightfully so. Um, my concern is, is that the early adopter agencies might have made those awards, as we mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, on a like-for-like -like basis. And are they still going down the MPLS path? Have they put the brakes on and said, okay, let's let's have discussions with the awarded vendor, or let's have discussions with the companies who are bidding still outstanding uh, fair opportunities, and maybe put the brakes on and sort of recalculate the spec. Now, would that mean that things will slow down? Well, they might slow down a little bit. They might even pause temporarily. I think moving to the new technologies and stopping any kind of activity to continue to build old technology into the scheme is, is not productive. So if that means we slow down, we do it right the first time, instead of implement the old technology, maybe with a new vendor, um, I, I think that may be worth, worth the squeeze. Yeah. So in other words, you could uh, have an overlap briefly while you get the new facility, the new SD-WAN and whatever transport you choose or transports you choose up and running. You don't have to have a hard date cutover when, oh, my God, is this going to work when we pull the switch? But you right, have right. One fade and, down and the other brought up. And another thing I think that, that could be a useful tactic would be to make those easy transitions to broadband technologies first, and that's out in the field. It doesn't require big pipes and, and the metro um, kind of uh, connections in, in cities and so forth. Get, gets quick service, faster service out to the field offices where the, where the rubber hits the road for the constituents. All right, good place to take a break on. My guest today is Tony Bardo, the Assistant Vice President of Government Solutions at Hughes Networks. I'm Tom Temin. This discussion is Federal Insights, Network Transformation and Modernization, sponsored by Hughes Networks here on Federal News Network. 